because the problem is not the amount of work. Can I get an amen to that? That is not the problem because that could be solved with a good nap and a good meal. Maybe a glass of wine. The problem is a soul. The problem is a soul.
Voices resounding heaven's fame Our God Be praised Forever Flood all the earth with endless light Raise up the streets from death to life. Our God, be praised forever. Oh. So oh. 
belong to him this morning. Oh, here I stay, arms open wide. Oh, I am yours and you are mine. Oh, 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 oh,
Um, just open with prayer just so I can tap into the anointing and uh, have less of me and more of him. Amen. Amen. So Heavenly Father, if y'all could just pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for the opportunity to come into your house. We thank you for the opportunity to, to not only hear your word, but experience your word in our lives, Father. We just pray for your Holy Spirit to open up our heart, open up our minds, Father, I pray that you would add an extra measure to our faith today, that we may go and accomplish everything that you have called and mandated and commissioned us to do. Father, I pray that your word would go forth just like the light that you say it is in your word and that it will dispel every bit of darkness that has loomed every, every single person's life over their minds, over their hearts, over their emotions, over their families. Father, we thank you for your engrafted word that goes forth like a beacon. And Father, I pray that this people would leave today with a renewed hope that does not disappoint. And we thank you for all of that. And in your name we pray, amen. Amen. And I tell you what, God, God has been so good. Amen. Uh, Pastor Brian, he asked me to um, preach from a devotion that I had actually uh, written for a constant devotion like a year ago. So uh, whenever I got the, the message for me to pull from that, I, I couldn't remember <laughs> what that devotion was even about. And I know some of y'all are looking at me right now, but some of y'all can't even remember what like you had for dinner last night. So, you know. But the devotion I'm going to pull from, uh, I titled it, The Intellectual's Yoke, The Arrogance Burden, and The Laborer's Unrest. And I'm sure that every single one of us at some time have fallen into that category to where we knew too much that we were of no good, to where we were so full of ourselves that the burden that we carried was so heavy or the fact that we walked and we felt as though we had to labor for everything that God had purposed for us. Every one of us has fallen into that category at some time. I'm going to pull from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. So if you could pull there or or if you could um, turn there or click there. Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30 says, Come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He said, come to me, learn from me, and I will give you rest for your souls. You see, and there's a key that that unlocks something in that scripture that is a key. It's something that is instrumental to us because I don't know about you, but I live around a lot of people, and I include myself in this bracket, that are very tired, that are stressed out, that are taxed, that are overburdened, that are just flat, plain out tired. And does anybody know what I'm talking about? You work and you work and you work and you work and you try your darndest to get ahead and it just seems like for every step forward that you take, you got something knocking you back two more. 
and you rally yourself together and you, get, you got everything you got and you, you put every effort forward and it just, it just seems that you can't get to where you need to go. You know, we, we live around people that are just so stressed out. I have never seen a generation of people all the way from, from the older to the youngest that are stressed out. And if you don't believe me, just go to Walmart. Just go to Walmart. Just, just go for a ride in my car with me, and I will show you stress. But we live around people that are just, they are ticking time bombs. They are just, they're like a cannon just, just, just ready to explode at any moment. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Is this just me? We're living in a time where look at the number of shootings that we have had in our schools. My goodness, we are living in a time where our children do not know how to deal and cope with the pressures of life. Mental illness is at an all-time high. And a violent disregard for life just seems to abound. And so many times we want to blame everything that we're going through, me included. I'm just tired. I'm just tired. I just, I just, I work too much. I'm just, I'm just, I'm awake more hours than I'm asleep and, and I'm not getting enough rest. And I'm just stressed out because this is going on and that's going on and I'm trying to get ahead. And, and so we go through all of these things and we like to blame all of that on our conduct. Oh, come on now. Or, or rather, we like to blame our conduct on all of that. But I know that's not the answer. If any of y'all ever went on vacation, you know, and, and you had a good week's rest, or maybe a three-day weekend where you got to sleep in, and if the problem were really that we're just so overworked, a good night's rest and a vacation would solve that. But how many of y'all know that a week back, after you get back from vacation, you're back to your own ways, you're stressing out, you're kirking out on people, you're snapping at people, you're hurting the ones you love, and you're flipping people off or rather pointing them to Jesus in traffic. <laughs> Giving them the right hand of fellowship. Because the problem is not the amount of work. Can I get an amen, somebody? That is not the problem because that could be solved with a good nap and a good meal. It may be a glass of wine. The problem is a soul. Please hear me. The problem is a soul that is not at rest. Because I don't know about you, but it does not matter how much sleep I get. It does not matter how much anti-anxiety medication or antidepressants that are available. If my soul is not at rest, nothing is going to solve the wrestling and the stress and the amount of pain and anxiety that I have, none of that solves any of that because the key to what is going on with me is a soul that is taxed and tired and not at rest. It is a soul that is searching for something that is real, something that is tangible, something that satisfies and is fulfilling, and I'm just not finding it. And I'm not going to find that in a bottle of Prozac. I'm not going to find that in, the bo in a bottle of wine. I'm not going to find that in a needle of heroin. I'm not going to find that in any of those things that the world wants to offer you. The problem is a soul that's not at rest. Matthew 6.25, if you could turn there and then like do something so you don't like watch me drink my water, you know. Matthew 6.25 says, No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. 
Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body or what you will put on. Is not life more than food and body, more than clothing? You know, I, I'm just going to stop right there. Is not your life more than what you eat, than what you drink? Is your life not more than the clothing that you put on your back? But I watch people who will work themselves into the ground just so that they can enjoy a good meal and look good while they're doing it. Um, I'm not talking to anybody in here. Whenever we look at, you know, every, whenever you are employed, you do realize that you are agreeing to your employer that I will give you this amount of a portion of my life in exchange for this amount of money. That's what you are agreeing to. And then whenever you purchase things, you are actually making an agreement to say, I took this portion of this amount of my life. In other words, if you make... $10 an hour, and you work six hours to get it, and you buy something for $60, you just took how many hours of your life to pay for that? Is it worth it? Is the stressed out mess that you are sometimes worth it? Is the time away from your children worth it? Is the time that you say that you don't have to serve God with worth it? Well, it's, it, it's quiet in here. They're not, they're not going to ask me to do this again. These are hard words, and, and I'm not going to say that I have mastered them. Anybody that's in my cell knows that I only bring the things that are, that are a current challenge to me in hopes that maybe we can all work in this thing together and encourage one another and help one another along the way because I know if I'm struggling with it, somebody else has got to be struggling with it too. Amen? But it goes on to say, is not life more than food and body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall I eat, or what shall I drink, or what shall we wear? For after all, these things the Gentiles of God, I'm sorry, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. Here's the key. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Why is it that we get everything backwards? My goodness, if I had a nickel for every person, it is so hard for me not to come off of the stage. I'm used to walking. I was told to stay here. But how come we get this so backwards so many times? If I had a nickel for every time, I have heard somebody say to me, but I want to serve God. I want to be a part of things, but I don't have time. I don't have the energy. Whenever the scripture clearly says here that we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things that we are stressing out about will be added unto us. But see, we live in a society that tells us that you have to have a certain level of education. You have to dress a certain way. You have to live in a certain kind of house and drive a certain kind of a car. Your family has to function in a certain kind of a way, and you have to talk a certain kind of a way if you are going to be successful at anything that you do. Oh, come on, somebody. We live in a society where we measure, my God, help me with this, because it's not even just a society. I'm talking about the church here on this one. We live in a time in the church where we measure the goodness of God 
by other people's conduct and by material possessions. God just stopped me right there. You know, you will never get an accurate measurement of the goodness of God if you're going to constantly measure how good God is to you based on the conduct of how other people treat you. Or how much your employer pays you. Or how your employer treats you. Because the moment that we do that, we make people and we make money our God. You see what the enemy is after? He is after your soul. See, we think that the enemy is after our house. We think he's after our car. You know, I've heard people say that I was on my way to church and I got a flat tire. And, you know, and you just get this image of the way they portray this. Like the devil was just like gnawing on their tire the whole way to church to keep them from missing church. I'm like, no, man, you just, the threads were showing you. You didn't get your tires taken care of. That's all that's wrong. Take care of your business. That won't happen. It ain't the devil. Sometimes things are just practical. I'm just saying. See, the enemy, he is after your soul. Can, can, I, can I open this up? Can I really open this up? Let's turn to 2 Timothy 3.7 real fast. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7, it describes those in the last days as always learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. We live in a day and an age where we are the most informed generation that has ever been. If there is a question that you have about anything as to um, anything, I mean, it could be really anything, um, uh, when somebody was born or what the carpet's made out of or why the sky is blue, all you got to do is pull out your iPhone or your smartphone and Google that bad boy and you will get a whole plethora of information on that. Some good, some not so good. Because we live in a time where we are the most informed generation that ever has been. We live in a generation that is so privileged. Just, just take some time and talk to somebody who lived during the Depression. When there was lack everywhere, people then were going through some stress. But yet we live in a time where we are so privileged and we have so much knowledge, yet we're the most discontented, stressed out, can't cope with life, opioid epidemic, shooting people up, people. Why? Why? It's all because the enemy is after your souls. You see, God put us here for his good pleasure. Amen? You know, I look at that sometimes and I'm like, really, God? Really? I don't know how good of a job I'm doing at that, but um, nonetheless, it's what you've said. You've put me here for your good pleasure. And, and what he's saying there is, I don't know about you, but any time that, that I experience something or try something that is really good and it was a great experience, I can't wait to run out and get a hold of somebody and share it with them so that they can have the same experience that I had. Oh, come on, I'm preaching. I'm going to open this up in about two seconds. You know, I will find them because I want them to experience the goodness that I just experienced. You see, and, and God, he put us here because he is good. And the reason he gets pleasure from us is because his pleasure comes from us being able to experience all of the goodness and the fulfillment of everything that he has just as he has experienced it. And so the enemy, he comes after your soul because your soul is what? Your soul is your mind. It's your will. It's your emotions. Your soul is the very thing that enables you to experience your life. So the enemy wants to skew your experience as much as he can. You know, isn't it funny how you can have two different people 
And one person can come into church service and say, man, that, that was awesome. That service was awesome. Man, I could feel the Holy Spirit. The word was good, man. And the people there, they're so loving and friendly and kind. I just felt so loved. And then you'll have somebody else say, you know, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't hear too many scriptures being used while he preached. And, um, you know, not one person shaked my hand. That is the most unloving church that I have ever been to. Isn't it funny how you can have two different people go through a moment and experience two different things? Because your soul is the vehicle that allows you to experience everything in life. And based on the condition of your soul is how you are going to experience and react to everything that comes your way. So the enemy is smart to this. So he is after you to try and skew your experience to make you bitter, to make you angry, to make you discontent, to try to make you think that you are not whole and that you lack. Because if he can convince you of that, You'll always be learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. You will always be in supply, but always coming up short. Because your soul is what enables you to experience your life. You see, in the soul, it, it needs help sometimes, you know. And, and I had titled this devotion, the, you know, The Intellectual Joke, The Arrogance Burden. And that's because sometimes, and I'm not knocking, uh, you know, being an intellectual and, and all that. I'm really not. I, I tend to be quite cerebral myself sometimes. Sometimes too logical for my own good. Because sometimes my logic and what I know will keep me from the experience. Can I get an amen, somebody? Because, you know, come on, let's, let, let's just face it. I remember whenever I was pregnant with my first child, and uh, a girlfriend of mine, she, she got me Lamaze classes. You know, that was really nice of her, because she wanted me to be prepared to have this baby. Let me tell y'all something. There was nothing, and I mean nothing, nothing, in that Lamaze class that prepared me for that. Oh, no, 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 just listen. My, my son, my son, you know, the one that never wanted to leave home, I had to kind of like, you know, the one that I had to look at and say, look, I, I am not going to be that mother on stepbrothers. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all don't. He was in the womb, and he did not want to come out. They induced my labor for three days. Three. The only other thing I can think of in all of the time of attorney that took three days was the greatest miracle there ever was. And it did not matter how much I read, how many classes I took, how many, how many ways that lady taught me how to breathe, or how many ice chips she told me that I could chew on. Nothing prepared me for the experience of that labor. Don't you all love it whenever somebody else that doesn't have kids tries to tell you what to do with yours? Or, 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 or the person who, who's only been married for like two years and you've been married for like 20 and they can't understand why, I don't understand why she, why she acts that way. I, I don't understand why he is that way. Well, it's like this. I don't care how many um, Oprah Winfrey shows you've watched. I don't care how many books you've read. Nothing is going to prepare you for the experience of marriage. And I'm saying all of this because experience is important. You know, whenever you go and you, you uh, apply for a job somewhere, yeah, they want to know how much you know. But they also want to know how much experience you have because they know that based on your experience, they know how you're going to perform on your job. Can I get an amen? Somebody. And if the enemy can come in in our walk with God and he can skew our experience, 
He can then dictate how we are going to react to every trial, every challenge, everything that we go through. Because I don't know about you, it does not matter how much I study my Bible, it doesn't matter how much philosophy I know, or how much schooling that I got. There are things that come up in my life sometimes that my logic cannot fix. You can know everything that you want to know, but trust me whenever I tell you, you are going to encounter something sooner or later that all of your knowledge and all of your education and and all of your intelligence is not going to be able to understand nor solve. What do you do whenever they tell you that you have cancer? What do you do whenever they tell you that you're going to be bankrupt, that you're losing your job? What do you do whenever the people that are the closest to you, that you love with all of your heart, and they hurt you and they wound you? All of the logic in the world is not going to help you to understand what is going on in that moment. You see, God is not logical. And, And I know this because God is love. Look at your neighbor and say, God is love. And how many of y'all know love is not logical? (laughs) Love is not logical. Love does not make sense. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 13 whenever it tells you, you know, love is patient. Love is kind. Love keeps no record of wrongs. You know, I've been really in love. But sometimes it's a little hard not to keep that record of wrongs, especially whenever the same offense keeps coming up and coming up and coming up. Can I get an amen? Because love is not logical. Love is supernatural. And God is love. But if we live our lives in such a way that we are disconnected from God, and our soul is not at rest, and our soul is in turmoil, we cannot even begin to accept nor give the love that God commands us to give. You know, we all say that I've accepted God into my heart, but really, how much of God have you accepted in your heart if you can't love your neighbor? If you can't even love your neighbor, if you can't even love the one that you pledge to love for the rest of your life, How much God do you really have in you? Because love sacrifices. Love goes the extra mile. Love does things that we can't even begin to understand up here in this cranium of ours. So the enemy comes after us to try to skew our experience, every relationship we have, every moment we go through, every encounter with our children, the enemy is there to try to skew that experience because he knows that if he can can taint your experience when you were five years old, he can dictate your action whenever you're 50 years old. No one can serve two masters. No one can serve two masters. We have one God, one, and he is love. You know, when Jesus walked this earth, you know, he he said something very profound, and he said, hey, whenever you see me, you see the Father. Because the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. And he took it a step forward, and he said, and you, you are in me, and I am in you. And then he took it a step further, and he gave us the commission 
to go and preach the gospel, to go and love people, to go and to see if our rest would fall on people's houses. And I just want to ask you today, whenever you are are, are chasing after God and you are pursuing God, and whenever you are living your life, whenever people see you, do they see Christ? And I'm not talking about, about a bunch of religiosity. I'm not talking about any of that junk. But do they see compassion? Do they see love? Do they see mercy? Do they see someone that's willing to sacrifice? Do they see somebody that is willing to lay down their life? You know, we think that because if we don't share a Facebook post about Jesus, that means we're denying him in front of men. Denying him in front of men is whenever we harden our hearts to the people that are around us. Whenever we become people that are arrogant and full of ourselves. Whenever we become people that are calloused and hard and judgmental and despise those that we can't understand. But we're supposed to be in Jesus and Jesus is in us and Jesus is in the Father. And the Father is in him. Because the earth is supposed to be full of the glory of God. And the glory of God is amazing. The glory of God is that that flamboyant, maximum, whole fullness of everything that God is. All of his goodness. That's the glory of God. But if we have a soul that is not at rest... We can't even begin to experience the fullness of everything that he has made available to us. Can I get an amen? We have to take time. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. But how come every time we come up against a challenge, we seek his hand and we don't seek his face? Oh, come on, somebody. (laughs) Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm the only guilty one of this, you know. But whenever I'm going through hard times, a lot of times my prayers tend to go like this. God, please help me. God, please, I pray for you to supply the need. God, I pray that you would heal my body. God, I pray that you would heal my children. God, I pray that you would just change that person. And we seek his hand and we seek what he can do, but we fail to seek his face. But if we can get a hold of him and we can learn how to seek his face, he said, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, learn of me, and you will find rest for your souls. Learn of me. Become like me. But yet, as soon as we get into trouble, as soon as someone hurts our feelings, as soon as we see a need, We want to seek what he can do for us instead of seeking to become like him. And if we could ever get a hold of the seeking to become like him, we want to become like him because in him there is no lack. There is no pain. There is no suffering. There is no evil. There is no jealousy. There is no violence. None of that is in him. So we need to get to a place where we learn how to seek him. We need to come to him whenever we are heavy, whenever we are weary, whenever we are laden down with burdens, whenever life is challenging us, whenever life is coming at us and the enemy is trying to do everything he can to skew our experience. My goodness, the very thing that we're sitting in right now, we call the experience. But how many of you come in? I I do it. Okay, I'm not just pointing the finger. Please don't misunderstand. Let me just put it this way then. How many times have I come in here on a Sunday, sang my song? You know, I I said the declaration, listened to the word, and I went home, and that week was no different than the week before. Because I did not allow myself to experience anything. And it wasn't because it wasn't being made available to me. You know, it's just like with your job. They want to know how much experience you have because your experience is an indication of what your conduct is going to be. So I challenge you to look at your experience. 
I challenge you to change the way you view every experience in your life, the way you experience your spouse, the way you experience your children, the way you experience your employment, the way you experience the people that you see on the street every day. Do we scoff at them? Do we point the finger at them? Do we carry that yoke of the intellectual or the burden of the arrogant or the unrest of the laborer? Or do we shake all of that stuff and take his yoke upon us? That word yoke, they, that was something that they used for oxen to, so that there was an equal distribution of weight. But that particular word in the Greek, it also indicates a balancing of the scales. Maybe I'm not the only one that's been walking around feeling like the scales have been uh, um, tipped in an unfavorable balance. And I was on the losing end. Anybody, anybody felt like that? It just seems like everybody else is way up here and you're way down here. But he said, take my yoke, my scales upon you. Take my experience upon you. I'll even out the playing field. All the highs and the lows, I'll, I'll fill in every valley and bring down every mountain. It's what he tells us. Because our experience is what, enables, what enables us to live life. Everybody stand to your feet. I'm going to challenge anybody, including myself. <laughs> I've spent three, three days, ask my husband, I, I've been in a weird, I don't, I don't know, the enemy just I, just, I just couldn't seem to shake some stuff, you know? And, and it, was, it was just messing up my whole experience of everything. You know, because when your soul's tired, and when your soul is not rested and isn't content, I don't care what kind of party somebody throws you. You're not going to enjoy it. You might put the smile on, but you're not going to enjoy it. I don't care what kind of a meal someone sets before you. You're not going to enjoy it. But, you know, my, my Bible tells me that the Lord is my shepherd. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And the enemy is going to do everything that he can to keep me from enjoying what the table that God has placed before me, the bounty and the nourishment and the experience and the atmosphere of everything that God has for me. And I'm not going to, I don't, I don't want to stand before God one day and say, God, I, I didn't experience my life because I was too busy. because I thought that I needed a nicer pair of shoes. Father, I, I didn't give that person a hand because, you know, they should have helped themselves. I want to stand before him and say, God, you've been so good to me. My experience... Thank you, God, for the experience. Thank you, God, for giving me the opportunity to live every single day that you had me on that earth, and I experienced it to the fullness of everything that you made available to me. That's what I want to be able to say. So let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, God, that you challenge us to live beyond where we're at right now, to live beyond materialism and beyond knowledge and beyond junk, Father, and beyond offenses and beyond pain. But God, you have an experience for us that is so light and so easy. Father, you have gifts and you add no sorrow to them. And so, Father, we just open up our hearts, we open up our minds Father, we open up that soul and we submit and we surrender to you and we say, God, heal, heal my soul. But God, I'm not just going to ask you to just heal it and me not do anything, Father. I want to become like you. God, why, why does my soul feel this way? I don't want to think this way. Give me your thoughts about it. 
Give me your feelings about it. Give me your ways about it. Because my way don't work. My track record ain't working. Father, I thank you for your anointing that's going forth even right now. Like you're ready to pay. Got your eyes out of socket. Like you're a mile away. Mouth shut like a locket. Like you're nothing to say. Speak your mind or come on, baby, free yourself. No!